So today we're going to be talking about the um, wide, the RAT5. This product information is on the screen now. Um, the RAT5 is, we have um, the student books in Braille, both in UEB and Nemeth. Um, the catalog number is on the screen and that at a cost of $152. And the assessment program in large print is also available and the catalog number is included on our slide. And as both of these items are available through federal quota funds. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Darlene Norman. Um, she's a licensed educational psychologist. She is a diplomat of the American Board of School Neuropsychology. She is the owner and co-founder of the Resilient Minds Collective. She's additionally the owner and founder of Embrace, Embraced IDEA. And she's additionally, and most probably most importantly, a parent of a child who is deaf blind. So um, I'd like to review our learning objectives for today. Um, we would like you to be able to leave the session with identifying the benefits of selecting the RAT5 for evaluation purposes. Um, we would hope that you'd be able to identify and describe the RAT5 subtests, identify the materials available for administration for students with visual impairments, explain examples of test adaptations, and examine key differences between the print and braille adaptations that can affect the validity of the administration and interpretation of the results of the test. We're gonna launch one last poll before we get started while we transition over. Um, our poll question for now is, have you ever used the RAT with students? Um, a, yes, I have used this product with students. B, I know about this product, but have not used with students. Or C, I am fairly familiar with this product. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point so we can let Darlene get set up. Hi, Darlene. Hi, good morning, everyone. Waiting for a few more responses on our poll before we end it. Um, we got a pretty good response here. So um, we're gonna share out. So on our, on our question, have you used the RAT with students? Uh, the majority, 45% said, I know about the product, but have not used it with a student. Closely followed by 42% of the respondents saying, I am not familiar with this product at all. And 13% of our participants said, yes, I have used this product with students. So we have a pretty good mixture, but a lot of folks that this is gonna be new information for, so that's exciting. All right, I will go at the head at this time and turn it over thank you. All right, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all today. And um, I'm glad to, to see and hear that the presentation topic is a popular one. Um, we will be covering the RAT5 today and learning more about the tool, particularly since uh, many of you um, have not uh, yet used the, the product and are becoming more familiar with it. My hope is that um, you will walk away from this presentation um, feeling more comfortable and confident in the RAT5 as an administration tool for your students with visual impairments and we'll be able to put it into action. Um, so I wanted to start first by just commenting about um, uh, when we are choosing and selecting assessments, you know, we really are uh, wanting to identify tools that are accurate and informed assessments that are meant to design the consumer needs. And so the consumer in this situation is oftentimes our students, but we're also um, addressing and supporting um, parents and our educational teams to provide information about a student's academic um, abilities. And so there are a number of um, wonderful series um, that have been occurring with the American Printing House's Access Academy. So it, I would say that when we um, review the RAT5 presentation, we are also, you know, I'm, I would also like to promote and encourage those of you who have not yet watched um, prior uh, webinars on assessment topics to, to really embrace and, and look at um, watching those series. Um, there are particularly covering topics of other academic assessments, the, the Woodcock-Johnson, and as well as covering cognitive assessments. And there are many things from those presentations that will also support in um, under, better understanding how tools, um, when you're selecting uh, assessment materials and making the choice to use them, and then more importantly, how you interpret that information and put into practice. 
So please, please reach out and, and look at those webinars as well, because I would say that they're very complementary to this webinar and learning um, more about how to use uh, administration tools for our population of uh, people with visual impairments. Okay, so let me dive into the benefits. Um, so this is, it's really important to note that when you're administering a standardized tool um, and it's an adaptive instrument, that you really need to take care with understanding that the setup of the administration is really important. So that, that preparation and planning that you spend at the beginning will help with your confidence level of um, at the end when you're looking at all of the assessment data to feel comfortable with uh, reporting and presenting those results. Okay, so. The other thing I wanted to share is that we're going to be, um, you know, talking about the fact that you chose the rat, um, and that the idea is that you're looking at providing an accessible um, assessment that generates qualitative data for interpretation, that also will provide you with meaningful information, um, really the present levels of performance for the individual, and um, so we're going to highlight the topics of how you use this information to um, prepare and administer and ultimately provide uh, uh, relevant information for your learner, okay? So one of the main benefits is that this in general, when we're looking at assessment materials, this is has a really quick administration um, ability. I will say when we're talking about administration for tools for our students with visual impairments, is that, um, you know, that preparation time to set up, making sure things are in place, it will generally um, add a little bit more time when you're talking about the administration of the subtest. But because this tool is relatively brief, um, overall, it's one of the, the quickest measures to administer when you're, when you're looking at um, academic information for a learner. Um, but in general, um, the, the, when we think about administering this to the um, to learners without visual impairments, you know, for our younger population, let's say students who are grades uh, K through five, you're going to spend about 10 to 25 minutes administering this. So if you um, think about doubling or tripling that time frame, you're going to spend approximately 30 to maybe a little bit over an hour if you're administering the whole assessment tool. Um, so think about that while you're budgeting your time and planning for administration. And then for our older population, so students in grades four um, through adulthood, really, um, you're going to um, end up spending the uh, about 30 to 40 minutes for just general population administration. So approximately an hour to 90 minutes or more when you're um, implementing this tool for a, a person with visual impairment. Okay, so the one of the things that's um, really beneficial to this tool in particular is the fact that it has a wide age range. So it's a tool that is, uh, you're able to use it with um, children as young as five years old and extends into adulthood. And there are many, many valuable reasons um, to have a, a long lifespan or a developmental um, span for the individuals that you're assessing. Um, you know, it's, we never quite know when materials will be reauthorized and then um, and a new edition comes out. So oftentimes you're, you're going to have access to this type of tool um, for many years. And so having the opportunity to use this with individuals, uh, when, whatever age they may be, especially in an educational setting, um, it just provides a lot of value for that. And in addition, when we think about a test that need to be adaptive um, or adapted to our learners, um, that can also take additional time. So that's um, so this tool um, is likely to be available um, for many uses and many opportunities to re-implement um, for um, a variety of learners, but also the individual learner over time. Okay. The, the next thing is looking at just the flexibility. Um, so this is a tool that um, you can use and structured in administer in the exact order that the materials are presented in. Um, or you can choose, you know, I only want to focus on an individual spelling, or I really just want to look at math because math is the primary concern. You can administer this tool as a single subtest um, assessment um, and you know, use that information if needed. So it's really flexible in that, in that design. So you have a lot of choices when you're thinking about the, the use and application of it for your, for your needs. And 
the other thing that I was going to mention on this one that's really important and is likely to generate most many questions is just the psychometric um, uh, soundness of the instrument itself. Okay, so um, one thing to make note of is that, you know, unfortunately, our, our population of students with visual impairments, most things are not um, administered to them, especially if these are widely used for the general population. Um, so <clears throat> the our, our our population of students with visual impairments or people with visual impairments, they tend to get screened out of standardized assessments, um, but we have a lot of value with using tools um, that do have standardized um, properties and, and scores. This particular test happens to have another type of score called the growth scale values that is um, what I would say really useful, particularly if you use this, this tool for multiple um, opportunities with one individual. It allows you to see a rate of growth and learning um, that you can um, measure that fits our students with visual impairments really nicely. Okay, so on the right side of our slide here, you know, what I was mentioning is that there are multiple uses for this evaluation. So, you know, if you're with a, a uh, one of your younger learners who's maybe in kindergarten or first grade, and they're coming up for, um, um, you know, an initial evaluation need for um, eligibility. This would be a great tool to use, particularly because of the, the flexibility and design of the assessment. Um, and, you know, you, you, there are situations where there are late um, identified uh, individuals with visual impairments or progressive vision loss. And so initial evaluations might occur at any time that the individual, you know, doesn't matter what age they are. Um, but it's a good measurement to use when you're um, learning information about the individual um, at the beginning of their educational career, um, and then to be able to re-administer it in a variety of ways. So we're very familiar with the triennial re-evaluation process um, under um, the individuals with Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the requirement to do at least a review of information and um, make a consideration for doing formal testing. Um, but another value is that you can do incremental progress checks. And so there are two forms that are available in this product that allow you to administer it flexibly and have a time frame that will allow you to measure growth and look at a rate of progress over time. So many benefits, many uses to this tool that will help you with designing and informing your, your team, your child's team that you're working with for um, uses. Okay, so let's learn a bit more about the, you know, what the test encompasses, so the subtests. Um, so there are four subtests and you get individual um, scores uh, with each of these four subtests. However, two of these you can combine into a reading composite score. So in, you know, if you administer the whole assessment material, uh, all the subtests within the tool, um, you can ultimately end up with five um, uh, data points uh, for use when you're uh, describing the learner and what their needs are. So when we look at the word reading as a subtest, you know, this is um, a great measurement that will that you'll be able to identify um, their ability of how they have letter and word recognition accuracy. Um, it, it will break it down into uh, lowercase initials as um, and and letters and uppercase letters, and also it will um, present the student with regular and irregular letter patterns. Okay. Um, same thing with spelling. You will look at how the subtest will identify an a individual's ability to identify single letters, um, but also um, when you put those letters into words and what, how they uh, are familiar and can apply their phonetic um, and whole word reading um, aspect into spelling words that they are, that they're listening to. Um, the math computation provides a measure of um, oral math computation skills. Um, it looks at how an individual can count their ability to identify numbers and solving simple spoken problems. And then there's a math computation piece that ranges from basic arithmetic to advanced operations. So these first three subtests that I mentioned, there's a part one and a part two section. Um, we'll be going through a more descriptive um, administration uh, recommendations um, and process when we um, get to slides later, but I just wanted to mention that they have uh, multiple parts and those are important to know. 
The sentence comprehension um, also provides a measure of sentence comprehension skills and then linguistic knowledge. And you're, the individual will supply a word to fill in the blank. So that way they're answering, um, you know, you're looking at how their ability to comprehend what they're, what they're hearing and um, use their vocabulary skills. And as mentioned, the reading composite score. Um, so this is, uh, provides a great measure of general reading ability that's available for, for the individuals. So each of these um, subtests will can result in a standard score um, based on age or grade norms. And um, so, um, and then we'll talk about whether or not you, you should use these um, data points or what other methods can you use for um, reporting the information that you've gathered from the assessment. Um, one thing to note, the um, sentence comprehension itself is um, only administered for students who are in first grade through 12th grade and um, adults. Um, it's not administered to our kindergartner. So basically you will not be able to get um, data points for um, in students who are in kindergarten and you will not get a resulting reading composite score. Um, but otherwise all of the other uh, subtests will allow you to administer it from grades kindergarten all the way through adulthood. Okay, so the next few slides um, talk about the different variations or um, types of kits that are available. Um, so it is important to know that you need to have the standard kit or access to a standard kit in order to uh, look at scoring the, the individual's um, actual performance. And so within the standard kit, um, you will have access to the manual for administration, the norms, norms book for looking at how you score it and the score obtaining the scores. Um, additionally, you'll have um, the response booklet, and, which comes in a blue and green form, a record form, um, and which also is in the blue and green form. And then you will also see the, the materials of the the word reading list and the spelling list card in both the, the blue and green form. And then there's a comprehension card um, that comes along with it as well. So each form has its own um, materials um, attached to it. And so that way, you, when you choose to administer the blue form or the green form, um, you have choices when you're uh, re-administering it, um, depending on your assessment interval. And Pearson has um, Q Interactive. So if you're not familiar with Q Interactive, um, this is um, an iPad administration. It's not necessarily recommended for administration for our learners, but I wanted to highlight that um, uh, Pearson has a Q Interactive um, live scoring feature that is available. It's, it's helpful in the, in the sense that it's an on-demand scoring that occurs when you use the Q Interactive um, process through, um, you need two iPads, that uh, communicate to each other. One is dedicated to the examiner and the other one is dedicated to the examinee, um, but you also have it set up through um, the computer. So you have a, a, a login that you then um, identify which uh, subtests are you going to administer and then you send it to your iPads. So it's a great system. It's super easy. And uh, once you get familiar and comfortable with it and it's a great way to have um, you know, quick information as a result. Okay, so the next one is the, the large print edition. So um, for the most part, everything is very similar. Um, again, these are supplemental to the, the main standard kit. Um, the, the, there are large print for all the student um, uh, books that are being used and their response booklets that they will uh, view when they're looking at materials that are printed, as well as what they are writing on their student response form. There is a, a teacher supplement. Um, uh, it's a, a brief notebook that comes along with it. Um, and the, the teacher supplement um, outlines the appropriate adaptations that are available. We will be reviewing those specifically in an upcoming slide. Okay, and here's just a, a quick visual. Um, if you are, if you have not seen the, um, the standard kit and the response booklets, I just wanted to highlight you know that this um, this shows a nice picture of um, that they use as much of the, the the actual white space to spread things out so that way things are a little bit more visually clear. It is larger um, as well, and um, um, it's a it's a, a nice version to be able to look at how they um, the standard um, presentation of information was adapted to the actual um, large print itself. 
Okay. And then for the Braille edition, um, this is uh, the same thing where we have um, a teacher supplement um, that's available. It also outlines the appropriate adaptations for this. We'll cover that in just a little bit. And then for each area, for subject area, the mathematics and the reading, um, there is a contracted and uncontracted um, uh, uh, book that the students um, can have access to as they're going through it. Um, as you you can see that there is not necessarily any um, writing that the student is going to do. Um, there are, it's basically an oral presentation, an oral answering response mode that the student will be able to provide. The student does not have an actual written response booklet that they would uh, are required to uh, in the administration of this um, Braille edition. Okay, so the there are special materials that can be utilized um, and, and really recommended. This is where it's going to be really important to be familiar with your students. So if you are, um, if this is one of your students, if you happen to be the TBI that is working with the individual, um, you'll be able to help communicate to the examination team. Um, you know, what are things that the student has access to and regularly uses. If you are um, a psychologist and you, you know, you're not quite familiar with this student, you know, really understanding and looking at their accommodations for testing um, that they use um, for also classroom accommodations and testing accommodations. Because if an individual is using tools that help them in the natural learning environment, you want to include that in the standardized administration process and then uh, make a notation of it in your assessment report. Um, so these are things that are listed specifically um, in the actual manual. So glare reduction sheets, um, any special uh, writing utensils, bold line writing paper and magnification devices. So if a student is regularly using these, again, you wanna make sure that you, um, um, you, know, you are incorporating this into the standardized administration. Um, many of these, uh, you know, some of these materials, particularly the glare reduction sheets, these are available. Um, it can be purchased uh, on the APH website. So I'd recommend doing that. Okay, so let's talk about procedures. Um, so the standard procedures, really it follows the regular um, standardization um, uh, model. There are, um, there's no uh, new specialty directions that come along with it. So really becoming familiar with the standard kit is important um, because the standard procedures um, are very, very much the same, um, but you're just making notations as to, um, you know, the information that's relevant for your, your learner. Um, the next one, the, the test administrator really needs to meet the qualification level, the requirements that the, um, the, um, the publisher has established. And the other thing that is, applies to both um, the, the large print and the Braille edition is that the test administrator is able to you know, reorient the student uh, booklets that they're using in order to assist the student as needed. Okay, so under the adaptations, um, the I'm actually going to try to, I have um, the poll that is in the middle of my screen. I'm wondering, Jeff, is it possible to um, take that off somehow? You can just click that out. That's just on, on your screen. Is it? Okay. Yeah. I think that the trouble on my end is that it seems to be covered, but that's okay. I will work around it. Okay, so under the accommodations um, adaptation, so really these are, you know, you're following the student's um, individual education plan, um, support plan, so that way you're uh, preparing what the adaptations look like. The setting accommodations, so when I talked initially about the um, preparation, um, you're really taking into consideration what does that testing environment look like for the individual? You want to um, make sure you're in a separate room that's quiet, um, provide any lighting that um, is supportive of the learner, um, and making sure they have good access to the materials that you're presenting to them. If there's any other specialty equipment, like the, um, a special table, um, just be prepared to have those in advance. Okay, so when we look at the large print, the um, 
every attempt was made to make sure that the intent of the test items was not altered. And so that means that anything that was written into the administration materials for the standard kit um, was included in the large print edition. Essentially, the test wording maintained. Um, the only thing that might be different is that the, you know, the because it was adapted for a larger font size, that um, the it might have pushed some of the wordings or presentation of the test items to another page or um, to the larger um, to the edges of the of the booklet. But in general, all of the um, all of the items maintained. Okay, and then if there's any images that were um, implemented, uh, there's um, they enlarge the illustrations for clarity and ease of um, uh, you know looking through the materials. Okay, so the font, um, the size was changed um, to be an 18 point font minimum and to Homa, and um, essentially. This is um, this is standardized based off of APH's recommendations and guidelines for administering um, standardized assessments and having a, uh, appropriate access. However, you might have a learner who does need more magnification. Um, you know, when you think about uh, administering a test, you want to make sure that the the learner can be alert throughout the whole process, and that there can be fatigue if the the print is still not large enough for them. So if you are going to implement that into, um, you know, a magnification, you know, you're addressing that through the accommodation side of things and you're making a notation of it in your assessment report as to why you, um, this, the learner needed that as an option. Okay, so. Same thing with the Braille edition. So every attempt was made to maintain the intent of the items um, and it's available in both contracted and uncontracted form. Um, and um, essentially um, other than that, there was not any other um, adaptations that were made for um, the edition as well. So very similar to um, uh, the standard kit just in the administration of the, the Braille. Okay, so we're going to address each uh, subtest at this point. Essentially, um, when we look at um, the word reading subtest, so I've notated here that these are um, just outline what the starting points are. Okay, and so for each um, subtest, there are going to be uh, required materials that you want to look at using. So you'll want to have access to the record form that is being used for you, that you're scoring um, and marking down the individual's um, responses. You need access to the word reading list, whether it's the Braille edition or the large print. You will also want to have access to the blank an online paper, and I'll explain that in a minute, and then an audio recorder. So um, an audio recorder is a great tool to use, particularly if you are unsure or want to go back and just double check uh, the administration or how the, the individual responded for accuracy and for any other um, details. Um, the administration, because there are, are two parts, one thing to know is that um, <coughs> Individuals who start um, with part two, um, you you um, for each of these subtests that we're going to cover, there's actually there's a discontinue rule for each of them, um, and so you want to look at seeing you know well when you want to discontinue an, an administration for the part two once the learner has had five wrong in a row, um, and then you'll be able to stop the assessment. If you are starting with a younger individual part, you will start with part one or developmentally. If the individual is approximately, you know, working, um, has skills in the grades K through two and you wanna start administrating um, a, a subtest because that's uh, what you anticipate what the reading levels are for success, you would start with a part one. And um, just note, there is no discontinue rule for the part one. You are going to still administer the part two as well. The discontinue rule ends with um, after for this subtest is when the individual is um, 
finished part two and has um, met the five um, uh, incorrect responses to discontinue the subtest. The reason why is that even if a learner may not be um, familiar with all the letters that are that they're um, being uh, tested on, they still might have some reading capabilities within the word reading um, part two section. It's important to remember to administer both parts for those younger learners if needed and to continue on. And um, Arlene, yeah. your mic is really fuzzy all of a sudden. Is there something rubbing against where your mic is? Paper Maybe. or something like that next to your computer? Maybe. Okay. Is that better? Yes, it's better. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, so the one thing I wanted to just highlight on this too. So I mentioned the, the blank and unlined paper. So if your if you if your learner gets visually distracted with too much information um, that's available, then you can use that blank piece of paper to cover um, items to reduce the visual distraction from it. Okay, so um, it's important to use those tools, especially when you're you know wanting to make sure that the student is performing their best on this type of assessment. Okay, spelling. So um, the rules are similar. So if you have an individual that is um, in grades K through two, you're gonna administer the part one letter writing. And, um, but you will have them continue to the part two spelling and the, you'll follow the discontinuation rule um, for um, five incorrect responses. Okay, so regardless um, if the, if you're a young learner um, and the great that you're administering part one and part two to, um, you want to make sure that you continue into the part two, um, similar to the reading um, assessment subtest. Um, so the materials you need for this one is to um, have the record form um, that you as the examiner will um, you know, be marking the responses in. And then there is a response booklet that the learner will use to write their answers. And then you'll have access to the spelling list card and you'll want a pencil with an eraser. Okay, so for this one, you wanna also uh, be mindful of that you can repeat the words if needed. So that way, the, the if the learner needs another repetition of it, you're able to administer that as part of the testing procedures. Okay, and then math computation. So for the, the materials needed on this, same thing, you'll want the record form um, that you will be writing responses and, and using for scoring. The student will have a response booklet, um, uh, particularly if they, um, with the large print edition. This is another one where you can use a blank online paper to be able to um, use to cover um, visually distracting items. Um, you'll want a pencil with an eraser and then a timer or stopwatch. Okay, and so this is the, the next subtest that does have a part one and a part two. The same rules apply for administration. And you'll want to make sure that if you have a learner who you start with the part one, you wanna continue into part two and follow the discontinuation rules of five incorrect responses before ending. All right, and then the sentence comprehension. So for here, we have um, just a reminder, um, we do not administer this subtest to students who are um, kindergarten. Um, it is not included in um, the standardization or nor will you get a, a score um, from this. The, um, the grades are um, outlined, you know, one through 12 um, or to adulthood. And then the, um, the administration, um, you start with the, the item one and so the sample item and then the item number listed below um, with the corresponding grade level for administration. And if you, um, when you're administering this, you wanna make sure you also are re, uh, reaching basils. So if a student is not having success with, um, with the, the administration, you will often find that you might need to drop back down into um, lower levels of administration. And I will say that this does play into um, the, the other subtests that um, I had just previously finished talking about. Um, if this individual is not successful with, with the, the part two and is um, not getting correct scores in the beginning of the administration, you will drop down to part one to administer um, those, that part one item. 
Um, for this one, you, you, the materials needed is the sentence comprehension record form. You'll have the comprehension card. This is for you to be able to read to the individual. And um, you can also use um, a blank online paper for, um, um, for administration as well. So for the, one of the things about this response is, is that the individual is going to be listening to the sentence that is being read to them, and they're required to answer in a one or two word response. Um, you'll um, any any words that are longer or any responses that are longer than that really um, may not be acceptable to the um, as an acceptable response. So you'll really want to consider what the students um, final answer is for these and to see where it fits in the scoring criteria. Okay, so I think this is probably the the part where um, you know everybody has um, a lot of questions and um, comments about, and so you know we'll spend some time um, talking about this in particular. The um, you know when we look at observations, the um, it's really important to know that the observations that you are collecting for the student is important. Um, to be able to write into your report. So you want to know if the individual has, um, you know, is demonstrating similar application skills as to what they might be doing in a, a, a classroom environment, being able to collaborate with your assessment team, the, the classroom teachers of how the, um, the individual responded to the administration of the tests. If there were any behaviors to make note of, you want to um, include that in your um, your write up. So if there was fatigue that you noticed, you know that's an observable data point. Um, observations are really important to making sure that you um, include that information, particularly because if we when we talk about the standardization of the um, scores, you know if you if you plan to use that. Um, um, that data as well. The, the natural observation data is extremely valuable, um, just as much as um, numbers can be when we're talking about our learners. Okay, so you also want to determine if you really, you know, collected the information that you needed from this uh, evaluation. So do you, you know, based off of what you've learned about the individual, do you need to administer um, additional assessment? Is there, um, would it be wise to use um, supplemental assessments um, that are either curriculum based um, measurements that you can administer that are informal um, or even consider another formal academic assessment tool? Or perhaps the RAT was that, um, that secondary tool that you use to just flush out whether or not, you know, um, you're answering your referral question for the administration of the test. And then, um, the it's really important to make sure that you're following the APH testing guidelines, um, especially when you're thinking about whether or not you're how you report the quantitative data versus the qualitative data. So talk a lot about of, about observations, and that's super important information um, in conjunction with um, you know making the decision to use quantitative information as well. Okay, so when we're talking in in doing report writing. Um, you know, it's really, 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 really important to focus on the individual. Um, so the when we are developing um, our reports, you know, one of the things that I would say, and I'm going to speak to the fact that um, I've sat on both sides of the table as the school psychologist presenting information to parents, to the educational team, and I've been the parent who has been receiving that information. And so... Um, the on the professional side of it, we want to make sure that we're, we're hitting all of our criteria that's required to meet our guidelines and be legally defensible we're and compliant with all the requirements that go into report writing. It's important to, you know, if it if something happened, you want to write it down. So if it's not in your report and you didn't you didn't write it down, but you know it happened then it's almost as if it didn't happen. So if it's not in the actual student record of, of the report itself, then you, you know, want to make sure that you, um, you know, are reviewing that for information and include any relevant information as possible. And so part of that is, you know, talking a bit about the assessment in your report, uh, but you really also want to make sure that you're focusing on the individual. So, you know, as a parent, 
you know, I don't necessarily, you know, I want to know about the assessment tool is that is being administered because I want to be familiar. I want to be informed. Um, and, you know, what did, what was my child um, doing um, in that type of um, um, section of that assessment? Um, but I also want to be familiar with this, with what did my child do? What was my child capable of doing? What were they successful in, in responding to? And what were they not successful with? So when you write your descriptions, particularly for a, a short assessment tool like this, you have, in general, you have more um, you have the ability to, you know, write a lot of details about the, the, the learner. And, you know, one of the things that we know um, as the outcome of standardized test results for our um, individuals with visual impairments is that it's likely to be a low estimate of their true capabilities. And that's just the nature of standardized assessments is that they weren't designed for them to begin with and they weren't um, incorporated into the norming sample. And so when you taught when you're you know writing about the the test itself you want to focus on what the student was capable of doing and what they weren't capable of doing so when you one of the things i want to encourage um um examinee yeah examiners to write about the examinee is to you know it, it provide some examples you you want to maintain the confidential confidentiality of the actual test itself but you, so not, you know, necessarily writing in the test items, because that would not be appropriate, but more so like these are the things that the child was able to do. So if we talked about like spelling, for example, you know, was the child able to um, uh, listen to and um, accurately spell CDC words? Did they struggle with um, particular um, sounds um, that were paired together um, versus like, um, you know, consonant blends or single consonants and vowels and things like that. So there are ways to describe the individual with the assessments. So that way it is tailored to them because it's really helpful and more important. And this will also go into helping to write your present levels for your IEP documents, also to help write with writing goals as to meaningful goals is to you know write about the learner when you're doing these assessments, not just indicating that the the individual was able to perform in the average or expected range or that they were below average or below expected. Um, and so the, the meaningful data of report writing is about you know, knowing what the individual's present levels are with details that you can, you can visualize and describe. Just knowing that a, a student performed in the below average range doesn't necessarily tell me about their direct word reading skills. Um, it just tells me that they were performing below their, the, their grade level or age level, depending on which norms that you ended up using. Okay, so this is, um, you know, really about uh, when you when you're using this for developing a student's IEP, you're talking about the educational benefit um, and using the the data that you you obtain from the RAT5 to be able to help write these documents, help progress report, um, and pro, you know provide direct information on that. And so it's um, especially if you're going to be administering this tool like the blue form and the green form. Um, you know, at regular intervals, so that way you're using it as descriptors, and and it's um, it will be helpful when you write that baseline information, and you're not just relying on standardized um, uh, data, the numbers themselves. Okay, so um, in addition to the report writing, you know, you do want to include um, different statements about it. What were the observations that you saw and noticed with the individual? Um, you know, what administration adaptations were used? Um, was there anything that was used um, and wasn't used? And why? Why did you make the choice to use something or not use something? And um, so those are um, really important with, um, you know, being familiar with um, you know, talking about, about the individual versus just the test, okay? Um, and you also wanna make sure that um, you know, you're uh, you know, administering um, the results and, and things are within the professional practice um, of your scope of practice. Um, and um, you're also thinking about the, the reliability and the validity of the re assessment results that you're reporting on. And um, that goes into making decisions as to whether or not you want to use the um, a standard score presentation. So for example, we 
we would not recommend that you isolate and identify and write in a report a single score. So I'll just use a standard score or a percentile score. So let's just say that the student had a, um, was right in the middle of the expected range and got a standard score of 100 um, or the 50th percentile. We wouldn't just write that score in for our, our learners with visual impairments. We would want to identify a confidence interval range using the 95th percentile. Conf confidence interval is really um, helpful and important because then you're allowing the flexibility to understand like this is not a, a static score for the individual, but this is the general um, uh, range in which they performed in on this particular day for this particular portion of the assessment. And so it gives the 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 reader of the report information as to like this is you know within um, with con, uh, you know a certain confidence um, uh, level the ninety fifth percent um, confidence interval per se that um, you, the true score falls within this um, and so it highlights that you know there there is variability with our are individuals with visual impairments and that they're not just a number that there's a lot of, there can be a lot of variation of where their scores land. And so to not be completely stuck on that particular score itself. Um, but like I mentioned before, there's this GSV score. So it, it is on one of the tables in the, um, in the scoring um, tables that you can look to make measurements and it's it's relying on a raw score so we would not we would not necessarily report a raw score when we're writing about the the individuals um, um, uh, answers and what the score that they got however on this particular assessment these these raw scores can convert into a gsb score which should be reported in this particular assessment so that way when this tool is readministered in the future or has the potential to be readministered in the future then that information can be um, you know reviewed and then considered and you can use this growth chart of information that helps understand like, did the student make expected growth within, you know, the administ re-administration time? So let's just say, you know, you, you use this for uh, a re-evaluation and you wanna use the same assessment tool for an annual review, just, you know, to see, you know, what the growth um, uh, was like for, for reading, spelling, writing, the comprehension. And you can use the, the GSV score to be able to help measure, you know, how much progress did the, the learner have? And so it's a really great um, score that's not in a lot of different um, uh, standardized materials to be able to use good, reliable data for progress monitoring and seeing those improvements over time. So I just wanted to make sure I highlighted that. Um, I did want to. Um, I'm I'm guessing that there might be some interest in um, having access to, you know, what would a report template look like for this. And so um, I know that's one of the the more challenging things sometimes is now that you've done the actual assessment, like, well, how do you put it into writing? Because the written document has a lot of value, and um, and it's you know that's where that's how you share information. And it's especially helpful for historical information when, you know, a future professional is going back to do a review of information of, you know, how the student has um, changed and grown over time. Um, that document is really important. So if there is of interest for this, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide individuals who email me with um, a report template that they can use as a guide. You know, there's many, many, many ways to write a report. And so there's no one, you know, right way that's better than others. But I know sometimes that beginning point can be challenging to get started and to incorporate some of these things. And the RAT5 itself is, is more likely than not to be used in a comprehensive assessment, especially if you're doing an initial or a triennial with a student. So it can be just one data point and you're, you're more than likely going to be using this in conjunction with other assessment um, materials with your team. Um, but um, I, I, I would love to be able to help um, provide you at least with a starting point if that's a, a barrier for, for getting started and knowing what to do. Um, but um, and if you are using it in isolation, like more so for, you know, progress monitoring or things like that, but you want to write up you know, a little bit of a blurb, you know, that's something I can um, provide you in a, a report template is that that growth measurement of how would you analyze that data and report on it as well. So I wanted to um, let you know that if you have an interest in that, please feel free to contact me and I will I'll help you with that.
Okay, so um, we have a few more minutes for a wrap up um, to some q and I know I see the chat has um, a few different things. Um, so I'd be more than happy to um, pause the presentation. Um, um, I will put my um, last slide here. It is uh, my contact information if you would like to reach out to me, particularly with that template report. Um, you can email me at darlene at resilientmindscollective.com and I'd be happy to um, get that to you. So I'd like to hear from our, um, our panel too. If there's any questions, I will stop my screen share and we can um, answer questions that people may have. Darlene, I'll actually start with one. Um, so we've talked a lot about using collaborative teams and things like that. So we have a mixture of a lot of different kinds of professionals here. How do you see that playing out with the RAT5? Yeah, so, you know, when with the RAT5, you know, it is, you know, you want to make sure that if you are as a team determining that you are going to use it, that you have the uh, uh, credentials and training to be able to administer this assessment. So, and now that, you know, you're familiar with it and you like, this sounds like it would be a perfect for my, my population of students that I'm working with. And, um, but I might not, I might not meet the criteria. You might be working with your team members to determine like who might be appropriate for that. You know, it's, it's really important to, uh, uh, you know, fall within our professional scope of practice. So that way um, the test procedures, um, the standardized part of the, the test procedures is followed um, because without that reliance, without that assurance, then, you know, it's hard to rely on the, the results or outcomes with accuracy and validity and, and reliability with it. And so, um, you know, oftentimes our individuals with um, vision loss, um, are not, you know, you're not in isolation working by yourself. They usually have a team of people that will be involved. And so within that team um, scope, you know, be a, being able to work with each other to identify, um, you know, oftentimes a, a TVI is, you know, informing a diagnostician or a school psychologist, whoever's doing the actual standardized administration of it. Um, you know, these are the guidelines of, you know, the, my, the students, um, accommodations, what we typically use in a classroom or testing situation to then help, you know, put into uh, place for the actual administration of the tool. So does that answer that question? Okay. It does. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Um, there's a question that just came into the chat that's not related specifically to the rat, but um. Uh, Mohammed was asking, what is your opinion about using the Stanford Binet and if it is suitable for VI students? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, I, I have not used the Stanford Binet since grad school. And I think even then it was becoming a real older tool and assessment. So I would caution the Stanford Binet for a variety of reasons. A, the norms are really old. You know, I haven't heard if it is, um, you know, do if, if, if the publisher is going to, you know, reauthorize a new edition for it, or at least update the norms of like, if you maintain the same materials, you really should do a normative update on it. And so I would just, in my professional practice, I would just caution the use of assessment materials that are not, don't have updated norms that are, um, you know, that you you can stand by and rely upon. So, and because there are other assessment materials, the cognitive testing materials, um, the Wilcox Johnson is a great, you know, is one that I I enjoy and use um, practically. Uh, the most regularly with my my students population because it has ease of administration and there's not a lot of manipulate there's no manipulatives actually so you know i know the stanford binet is um has a variety of you know tools that go with it um but i would just you know if you are going to use a, a tool like the stanford binet or any others that have older norms you really want to look at the actual tool itself Make sure you're familiar with the standardization procedures and the manual and be comfortable with it. So you can you can use any assessment materials if you if you feel that you can stand by the the application of it and you the usefulness of it. Um, and you know, when you administer standardized assessments, you don't have to use a standard score. You don't have to use that that information. You can use observational data to go along with your assessments themselves to still get good information along with it. 
But I will say your, your time is valuable and so is your learners. So if it's not gonna provide you with the information that, you, that you're looking for, then I would caution against using it. I'm really excited to see this update, Barlene, on the, the RAD. Um, as a disability service advisor at the university, um, I know getting, you know, there's these requirements and at K-12 level as well for having validity and tests that are of newer, newer norms. So having this updated test is and it is an efficient test. So frequently, I know the university and any program looking at accommodations at the university level is looking for some type of academic test score. So this is a really excellent tool for students who are otherwise maybe low vision or blind that they need some academic records that they haven't had that done recently. So the idea that that could be implemented in high school is fantastic. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that you know, many of our learners will, will can head off to college if that's of interest to them. And so this, I, I, I appreciate this tool because of the depth of age, the wide range that's available because it can follow the learner and, and provide good data, especially on those, you know, key skills um, that can play into accommodations. Watching the chat, um, we are about out of time. So we're approaching that uh, ninth hour. Um, for those of you listening for ACVR, you can